you doing this morning? Good. You ever, uh, you ever felt like you're on the outside looking in? Anybody ever had that moment? Uh, one of my, like, the funnier moments recently for Carrie and I, was, like, I don't like to dress up. Um, like, I just don't. If I wear a suit, my kids, the question out of their mouth in the morning is, are you doing a funeral or a wedding? Because they know that is the only reason why I'm going to get in a suit. I would much rather be wearing jeans and a hooded sweatshirt and a pair of Vans and let's just go about our business. Well, we had a friend, somebody that we knew, and they were, we were close with them, but not extremely close, and they had a, a family member that passed away. And so we were going to go to their uh, the, the visitation uh, with them to, to honor the relative and to be there for our friend. And, um, but again, we, we weren't super close, didn't know them really well. And so um, I put on a suit and a tie because I'm getting ready to go to a funeral, and Carrie gets dressed up in, you know, whatever funeral attire, but she's dressed up nicely. Um, and we show up and we walk into this place where the visitation is happening, and we walk in, and it's like all the eyes, it was in a different town, it was in a really small town, all the eyes just swing to us, which happens in, in that kind of a space anyways. But we realized right when we walked through the doors that we were the only people that were dressed up. Every single other human being that was in that space, and there were hundreds of people, nobody was wearing a tie, nobody even had on a sport coat, nobody was wearing like Carrie's fancy lady clothes, nobody's wearing any of that. Everybody was actually wearing sports garb. They were all wearing jerseys and warm ups, and the person who had passed away was huge into sports, and apparently, Everybody else got the memo that to honor their memory, nobody was going to dress up. They were all going to wear like their local sports team that they supported or their national sports team that they're supporting. Everybody else got the memo except for Carrie and I. And we walk in and it was just like losers, losers, <laughs> losers, losers. And I hate dressing up anyways. And I just walked in. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, you just like, you know, nobody likes to be the odd person out right? Like, we want to be on the inside track. We want to be in the know. And it was like there was this neon sign saying, they didn't actually know this guy that well. Uh, they don't actually, you know, they're, they're not one of you. They're outsiders, you know? And none of us like that feeling. We all want to be on the inside track, not on the outside. And that's, that's actually what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about this idea of outsiders versus insiders. Um, we live in, in a moment right now where there are ins and outs and social dynamics that are changing at a dizzying pace. You know, it, it used to be that you could, you could live most of your life, and right or wrong, God has an opinion about insiders and outsiders and that whole mentality, no matter what cultural moment we live in, okay? But it used to be that um, you could you could sort of insulate yourself, and people did. It, there's like some kind of a psychological comfort that we find in being around people that are like us. And so you would see people, they would live in places where it was mostly like their race or their ethnicity. Um, you know, you'd be in the same socioeconomic kind of class in the place where you lived. You could sort of, um, again, right or wrong, and God had an opinion in all of it, like how we, how we would do that. But there was this um, you would have this framework and people would believe the same things as you religiously or you would value the same things morally and that was just sort of the way that this particular culture would be and there might be other cultures that were different but where we are, this is kind of how we do things. That's, that's all going away. I mean, like with the rise of the internet and again, I don't think that God actually wanted us as we'll see. God didn't actually want us to insulate ourselves but it was really easy to do that. And right now, it's like this assault on any of that kind of comfort with the rise of the internet, um, with the ease of travel. I mean, it's never been, you know, I know, I, obviously right now in COVID, that's a little bit different, but uh, at, at some point, it's going to go back to the way that things were probably. And the ease of tra it's never been easier to travel all over the world and to be exposed to other cultures with the rise of, of different apps for our phones or whatever, where we can actually be connected to people all over the world. Ideas from different parts of the world, ideas from different kinds of cities, ideas from cultures, not what we're used to, are hitting us all the time. All the time. And with that, in a lot of ways, it has stirred up in our culture, we talked about this a few weeks ago, more of a tribalism. Like, rather than embracing that, and for us as the people of God, because God actually doesn't want us to be insiders versus outsiders kind of people, rather than us seeing the diversity of the moment as an opportunity to more easily step into the calling that God has for us, what has happened even within the church is we have gotten threatened. 
by those differences and by those changes. And like, it's normal to feel your, your normal being upset and to feel rattled by that. You know, when we're used to living a certain way, that's totally normal. It's not okay for us to stay in that, but it's okay for us to go like, okay, but this is a big change. The world is changing in shocking ways, and we should deal with that, right? So uh, this whole idea for us as the church, it should be opening up for us this posture and this mentality of, man, there has never been a better time to do what God has called us to do, which is to open up our lives and our hearts to people that are other than us, that are different than us. Not a time to draw up territorial boundaries for us. So what if we, as the followers of Jesus, acted like Jesus acted? And what if we went to others that were not like us, that didn't fit within our moral frameworks, that didn't speak the same language as us, that didn't think the same way that we thought, that they were different than us? If you look at Jesus, he did that all the time. And what if we gathered with strangers to share simple human pleasures, like meals? And again, I know it's COVID. I know this is a little bit different. This hits a little different. But uh, the concept, God is still calling us to live in the same way. What if we got to know other people and we let other people get to know us? What if we took that risk of being rejected? What if we took that risk of loving somebody that might actually put us in a situation where we're not exactly sure how we would navigate it, but we know we're called to love them? What if we stepped into those kinds of things? It wouldn't erase the differences for us, for sure. Like that, that doesn't, you know, there's always going to be differences, but it might cancel out some of the fear. And it actually might allow people to see Jesus in our lives in a way and in a context that they never would have seen Jesus if we hadn't stepped out in that way. If we hadn't lowered some of the boundaries and some of the defenses and stepped into those situations. But in order for us to do that, first, hospitality must resist fear. And we're in this series uh, called Beautiful Resistance, and we're laying out Okay, our culture tends to live in this particular way, and we lay out one character trait of the culture, and then we go, but we're called to resist the way that our culture lives by living out this way that is opposite of the culture. How is the kingdom of God supposed to cut against the grain of the culture that we are a part of? And so for us right now, and again, it's not picket lines, and it's not drawing up lines of differentiation in a way like a shouting match. It's in a way where we beautifully resist some of the broken aspects of the world around us. When we see what's beautiful in humanity, um, when we interact with each other in beautiful ways, that's us reflecting the image of God the way that we were created to reflect the image of God. And when we see brokenness and division and strife, that's actually where, that's the brokenness of humanity that's shattering our ability to reflect the image of God. So um, so we're, we're looking at how do we beautifully reflect? How do we beautifully resist? And this morning I want to talk about hospitality must resist fear. There is this fear for us in things that are different. Some people love to try new things, and other people hate to try new things. Some people love new experiences. Some people hate them, avoid them at all costs. Um, So we're basing a lot of our thoughts on a book by John Tyson called Beautiful Resistance. Um, That's kind of the framework that we've been using. It's a great read. Uh, So hospitality. Let me just really quick define this biblically for you. Hospitality, like how you would actually define it, again, when we read the scriptures, we're reading um, an English translation. They were originally written in another language. So they were originally written in Hebrew in the Old Testament and mostly Greek in the New Testament with a little bit of Aramaic sprinkled in for good measure. Um, So sometimes we go to the original languages to understand a little bit more deeply. So in the New Testament, the Greek word that is translated as hospitality, the Greek word is, uh, let me make sure that I pronounce it right, okay, uh, philoxenia. Hospitality is philoxenia. And that is actually a compound word, philoxenia. Um, It's made up of two words that are smashed together to give it its meaning. And those two words that are smashed together is the word philos and xenos. So philos and xenos are the two root words that are smashed together to make philoxenia. Um, Philos means friend. It's the word for love in a like non-erotic kind of way. So it is like this, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's from philos. That is the root word of that, uh, of the city of Philadelphia. So, uh, f- uh, so philos is friend. It's, uh, again, it's not a sexual kind of love. It's a brotherly kind of love. It's bringing someone into the family. Uh, xenos is, uh, it's actually the word for foreigner. 
So xenos is foreigner. So like philoxenia, hospitality, literally means to make a friend out of a foreigner. Or for our purposes, to make a friend out of a stranger. It's not necessarily someone, it doesn't have to be somebody that's like, you know, from a different country than what we're from but somebody that's different than us, to make a friend out of a foreigner, out of a stranger, out of the other. And we are called to be hospitable to the people around us, to open up our lives and to welcome them into our lives, to make them friends. Rather than fearing the other, somebody who's other than us, to love them, to welcome them in, to uh, love them in the way that we would love a brother, in a way that we would love a family member. And I think sometimes, like for me personally, when I think about hospitality, it's almost become, in our culture, at least in my experience, it's almost become synonymous with the word entertaining. Like if you are hospitable, it means you like to have people in your home. You like to have people over and cook for them. You like to have people bring food over. You like to have game night. You like to do things in your home. And we kind of like equate hospitality to that, which the danger in that is we're defining hospitality by, enter- like, who do we usually invite over when we want to entertain, when we want to have game night? It's people like us. It's our friends. It's the people that we already click with. We already know them. They're safe. It's not the stranger or the foreigner or the people that are other than us, usually. And so that's a wrong way. We have to be careful that that sort of, uh, I guess, colloquial, like our way of looking at things in our culture doesn't sort of bleed into what the Bible is actually talking about. Because what the Bible is actually talking about in hospitality is seeking out people that are not the same as us. People that we would actually probably not be super comfortable with. And then inviting them into spaces in our lives where we're going to allow them to become our friends. We're going to seek out the foreigners, the others, the strangers to make them our friends. So fill in the blanks with whatever that looks like for you, right? That might literally be somebody from another country, somebody who speaks a different language, and, and, and that's somebody that you need to learn to be hospi- uh, hospitable towards. Um, that could be someone that is just, a, maybe they're not from a different country, but they're a different ethnicity. Maybe they're from a different, you know, socioeconomic status than what you were raised in or what you currently, the circles that you move in. They live at a different income level. Maybe, here, let me like break it down a little bit more. It might be actually making someone who is a foreigner or other a stranger that actually becomes a friend. Um, That might mean befriending somebody who has an addiction. That might mean welcoming into that space in our lives of brotherly love, somebody that has a different sexual orientation. That might mean us welcoming them into our lives, um, somebody who has mental illness, somebody who makes decisions that we disagree with. They might have a different morality than us, or they might be a different religion than us, or frankly, in Western Christianity, they might have a different brand of Christianity than us. What would it look like for us to, instead of drawing up lines of differentiation, try to embrace the foreigner and to make them our friend? See, Jesus did this, and he used food all the time. Like a quick, let me give you a quick bullet point through the Gospel of Luke. Um, you can, uh, Tim Chester, who's a, a pastor in the UK, says that hospitality and specifically meals, gathering around meals, was not a part of Jesus' strategy. It was his strategy when you read through the Gospels. So let me give you just a, a really quick representation in the, the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 5, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. In Luke 7, Jesus is anointed at the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. In Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. In Luke 10, Jesus eats in the home of of Martha and Mary. In Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and teachers of the law at a meal. In Luke 14, Jesus is at a meal when he urges people to invite the poor to their meals rather than their friends. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Uh, In Luke 19, Jesus invites himself to dinner with Zacchaeus. That's my favorite one, that he just invites himself over. Um, So so maybe sometimes you open your home, sometimes you're like, hey, can I come to your house and hang out for a little bit? (laughs) Uh, In Luke 22, we have the account of the Last Supper. In Luke 24, the risen Christ has a meal with the two disciples in Emmaus, and then later eats fish for the disciples in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, and really in the Gospels, he is either going to a meal— eating a meal or coming from a meal the entire time that you read about him in the Gospels. It's constant. And I would argue that it's not just because we have to eat, 
okay? Yes, we have to eat, but is, don't you think it's a little bit odd that the eating habits of Jesus are showcased so much? In the life of somebody so prominent that we're trying to learn so much from who has so much teaching prowess and truth and the power of the kingdom of God that that is what's being laid out for us over and over and over and over and over again in the Gospels. I think there's some profound truth for us that we need to realize. And that profound truth is that God is calling us to lower our guards, to lay aside fear, and to instead respond with hospitality, to welcome the foreigner, the stranger, the other. Again, fill in the blank with how you would define that, with what that would mean in your life, because it would be different for, for all of us. But right now in our culture, there's, like, we're doing things differently. And I would say, I think the church has, has we as the church, we've allowed this methodology to creep into to our living instead of doing the opposite, instead of us seasoning the culture around us with salt, um, we're, we're kind of allowing fear to step into. And there's a, uh, a theologian and a teacher of, of uh, theology and ethics. His name's Andrew Shepard. And he talks about th- that the, the mode of operation for us in the Western church and in America in general, but um, it, it really has to do with, and it's the culture around us, but the church has kind of adopted it in a lot of ways. There is, uh, rather than inclusion, rather than hospitality, we've actually uh, begun to exclude other people. We've begun to draw up boundaries, begun to um, point out differences and highlight those kinds of things. And, and again, I'm saying, like, I know this is normal for us as human beings, but that would be a reflection of our brokenness not a reflection of the character and the nature of God. And he says that we end up, uh, exclusion, it fleshes itself out that there are four steps to exclusion that we move through. Um, And he says that the first step is elimination, that we eliminate people from our social circles that aren't like us, okay? That could be literally we just make decisions on who we're going to spend time with and it just sort of excludes other people that aren't like us. Or it might mean that we lobby to see legislation passed to keep people that are not like us from being with us or being around us. Like we want to keep us, us, and we want to keep not us, not us, right? So it could be everything from like our individual choices all the way through to the way that we engage in politics. Um, Sometimes that can actually include violence, that we want to push other people away from us. We want to keep them away from us if they don't think like us, they don't act like us, they don't believe like us. So elimination is the first step. Uh, If we can't eliminate, we move to assimilation. And so if we can't keep them away and keep people separate and have our, like, who we are, our us-ness be at the center of everything, then we want to assimilate. So you can come and you can be a part of what we got going on here, but you got to be like us. You got to talk like us. You got to think like us. You got to decide like us. Um, We want to make them basically like just other versions of ourselves so that we don't have to live with undesired differences. Because again, I mean, who is not uncomfortable with things that are different than what they're used to? Again, that's normal for us, but the people of God are called to push back on those impulses. So we eliminate, we assimilate. If we, if those don't work, then we move to domination Uh, Domination is where we're not just encouraging or trying to press assimilation, but it's actually dominating other people. We are trying to normalize our behaviors, normalize our way of thinking, um, and we want to normalize our standards and penalize anyone that doesn't live at our standards, that doesn't think the way that we think or that doesn't do things the way that we do. Now, I, I, I can feel it in the room, okay? I know that these are not easy conversations, uh, which... We've had lots of not easy conversations, I would say, in the last year or so. Um, I get longer than that, but but we've especially been having lots of difficult conversations. My challenge to us as a church family this morning is let's let's peel back some of these layers and let's just, let's, rather than going, well, that's not an issue for me or trying to find, like, and I'm saying this because I know what I do when I hear things that are kind of a tough pill for me to swallow. I try to figure out why it relates to somebody sitting next to me more than it relates to me. I try to figure out how, like, the one instance where that wasn't true in my life so that I don't have to be convicted about it. It's like, no, that one time I did that one thing, and I'm like, I want to just try to, like, let's not be that way. Let's have an honest conversation and go, you know, Holy Spirit, if there's some things you want to speak to me, then do that and give me the courage to face into that. And if we're feeling fear or we're feeling 
claustrophobic in this conversation or we're feeling like, but that goes against the way that I've lived or the things that I've learned or the, you know, the way I've approached life. Like, let's pay attention to the feelings that we're feeling and the thoughts that we're thinking in these kinds of moments. So we eliminate or we assimilate or we dominate. We're penalizing other people for any kind of variance. And then the fourth one is we demonize. It's demonization. We remove people's humanity to justify our perspective, to justify any behavior that we want. And so it's the craziness of people that aren't like us. How could anybody think that way? How could anybody live that way? That's craziness. And all we're doing is taking steps towards removing the humanity of those people that don't fit in our cultural context. Anyone that's foreign, other, or stranger. And what ends up happening for us is like we are taking our thinking from a broken world when we engage in that as the church. And I think this is, I think it's, this is something that we need to pay attention to. And I have felt this um, for a lot of years, but I just feel like just a magnifying glass on it right now, is it is so easy for us to lose sight of the supernatural that there is a very real spiritual enemy all around us. And there's only one enemy of God. It's Satan. It's Lucifer. And any of the brokenness that we encounter in humanity around us is the result of that one enemy doing his work in the lives of humanity. And so God is constantly speaking to his people, challenging us and encouraging us to keep focused at the front of our mind. Paul said it in Ephesians, and it's interesting that Ephesians is all about our identity in Christ, and then it shifts gears to how our identity in Christ should impact all of our relationships, and he talks about all these different relationships, and if you're not paying attention, you sort of like look at the end of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, at the tail end, there's this whole passage on spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God, and it feels like, Paul, you're losing your mind. Like you're talking about this one specific thing about your identity in Christ and about your relationships and all this stuff. And then it feels like he just takes this totally out of left field. He starts talking about spiritual warfare. And the reality of it is, is that spiritual warfare happens in the context of interpersonal relationships with other human beings. And he warns us in Ephesians 6, 12 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That the flesh and blood issues in front of us are not the issues. That there are deeper spiritual issues and spiritual forces at play behind the physical issues. And he's saying, listen, don't take your eye off the ball. Don't take your eye off the target. Remember that there is more going on than what you can see. There's an enemy of people's souls. And the enemy of those people's souls would love for us to draw boundaries of exclusion and going, well, this is what we value and this is how we live and you can come in or you cannot come in, but this is the way that we live. The enemy would love nothing more for us to function in that way. Jesus functioned in the exact opposite way. Jesus, it felt like he was constantly sticking his fist in the beehive going, what's the most socially awkward situation I can put myself into with religious people? What is the thing that is like taboo for religious people to do? It's taboo to love those people. I'm going to go sit with the prostitutes. I'm going to share meals with the prostitutes. I'm going to let the prostitutes weep at my feet and pour perfume and wash my feet for me and dry them with their hair. And all the people around Jesus were like, dude, do you know who's doing that? Like, you should not be doing that. This does not look good. And Jesus is like, I'm working here. There's something going on, and I don't really care what my reputation looks like, and I don't really care who you think I should be rubbing shoulders with. I came to seek and to save that which is lost, right? So Jesus pushes back on this over and over again, and I love what John Tyson writes about this. He says, when the church takes her cues from culture, which is the opposite of a beautiful resistance, and we eliminate and assimilate and dominate and demonize image bearers of God. She, the church, we, bear no resemblance to Jesus Christ, whose compassion 
defied all social categories and was defined by deep embrace. Let me read that again because that is powerful. When the church takes her cues from culture and eliminates, assimilates, dominates, and demonizes image bearers of God, she bears no resemblance to Jesus Christ, whose compassion defied all social categories and was defined by deep embrace. And I think part of the issue for us is that we forget that we are the stranger when it comes to the gospel. That when it comes to approaching God, it is only the hospitality of God towards us that gives us any hope of having a relationship with him, of having our lives transformed. It's only the fact that God looks at us and goes, yep, they are a stranger and a foreigner. They are not like me. I created them to reflect my image and they are not doing it. But what does Romans 5, 8 tells us? That while we were still sinners, while we were still sitting in our brokenness, that God demonstrated his love for us by coming to us through Jesus Christ, by offering himself for us. See, we tend to flip the script and read the story. Like, I do this all the time. It's like, I, I heard somebody say, it's Disney princess theology. If you always read every story in scripture and you are always righteous King David and you are never horrible King Saul. You are formulating your theology like a Disney princess movie where everybody watches the Disney, Disney princess movie and goes like, I resonate with Rapunzel. Like she's stuck in the tower and all of life is conspiring against her and she's the hero of the story and it's like we construct theology where like we're the good, we're the good ones and like it's so good that God came for us because like, he could see that we're really, really good and then we sort of distance everybody else and we, we read theology in that way instead of understanding that according to Scripture, listen to Ephesians 2.11. Listen to what Paul says. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Listen to those descriptors of who we are without Jesus. That we are separate. We are excluded. We are foreigners. We are hopeless. In the story of redemption, I am the stranger. I am the outsider. I am the foreigner. I am the person that's other. And it's only by the great hospitality of God through Jesus Christ that I have any shot of having a relationship with God that have any shot. It's only because God erases the border and he welcomes me in to be his friend and he makes me a part of his family. That's the only hope that any of us have. But somehow we get out of that mode of thinking and it becomes us versus them. We're in and they're out. There's a, a, a beautiful image of this that I, I want to read. It's a, a, a friend of Carrie's and, uh, and mine who went through some issues in uh, the past couple of years, and she wrote really beautifully about hospitality that she received um, in, a, in a post on social media. And I just, I just want to read it, okay? So I'm quoting all of this, but I, I want to I read this. I had never heard of this, and I looked into it. This is really, really beautiful. The city of Giel in Belgium is renowned for its hospitality toward those experiencing mental health problems. Since the fourth century, Giel residents have had guests or boarders. These are just residents of the town. Have had guests or boarders living in their homes with them. The legacy of their hometown martyr, St. Dymph, what a great name. Uh, <laughs> St. Dymph, who cared for the mentally distressed, has lived on for centuries. The residents of Giel don't, uh, don't see care of the mentally ill as sainthood or charity, Rather, they see it as an opportunity to learn and a practice of acceptance for those facing mental health problems or illness. Guests are not treated as something or someone to cure. Rather, they are simply accepted into a loving and secure unit of family. She says, our friend says, when I first heard about Giel, I myself was facing some mental health issues. And though my diagnosis thankfully didn't leave me in a distressed state of life, a distressed state for life. 
I was getting a pretty harsh glimpse of life for those facing mental illness. As I went through my own journey, I was feeling the stigma of mental illness for the first time. People were afraid. They didn't know what to say or do. But then at the same time, there were others who unexpectedly moved towards me, who asked questions, who took me into their homes when it was hard to care for myself. This mere act of hospitality was one of the greatest gestures of love anyone had offered. It caught me as I was free-falling and gathered all the pieces that felt broken. Since then, I have thought a lot about hospitality. When I look around at the beauty that surrounds me, I am convinced of God's view of hospitality. He gave us this incredible, vast, extravagant, creative, and diverse planet as an act of hospitality towards us. He not only sets the lonely in families, as Psalm 68, 6 says, but he gave us this indescribably beautiful place to live, and it is a reflection of heaven, though it is imperfect at the moment. It is still a reflection of heaven. And I wonder if we valued hospitality in the same way that he so clearly does, if we'd experience a little more of heaven touching earth. I think the small town of Giel in Belgium is a humbling and beautiful example of that, tr- of that truth. Imagine an entire city where the norm in that culture is extending care and concern and extending the borders of family and home to include people who are not like you, who are difficult to deal with. It's not simple. It's not a fairy tale where everything just clicks and it all goes well. It's messy. It's painful. It's difficult to navigate. And I just wonder for us, CLF, imagine if we became a community that lived like this. Imagine if all the people represented in this room and all of you that are watching online, if all the pockets and community that we lived in, if we functioned in this way, what could happen? What could happen? I love what Alan Hirsch says. He says, if every Christian family in the world simply offered good conversational hospitality around a table once a week to neighbors, we would eat our way into the kingdom of God. (laughs) Doesn't that sound more enjoyable than some of the approaches we seem to be trying to take right now? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not trying to make it sound simplistic. And I know it's more difficult in this season, but I'm telling you to open up our minds to people that think differently, even as our circles may need to stay small because of COVID, what would it look like for us to embrace people with other ideas virtually? What would it look like for us to share a virtual space with a meal with somebody that doesn't think like us and ask questions, getting to know them, extending friendship to the person that is a foreigner or a stranger? What would it look like for us to share our meal in the cafeteria at school with a student that we don't normally eat with? What would it look like for us to maybe expand our social circles just a little bit so that we can invite somebody into our home life? Only God knows the answer to those questions, but I believe that he's calling us to live in that way. So, let's pray. Let's ask God to do this work in our hearts. I believe that if we're open to it, God will give us creativity even in this season on how we can be hospitable towards those that are not like us. God, we come to you this morning We thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your hospitality towards us. God, we are humbled by your goodness to us. Guard us from taking your hospitality and getting stingy with it towards others. Keep us from that. God, would you instead fill our minds and incline our hearts towards those that are not like us. Fill us up with grace and love, even as you've extended grace and love towards us. God, I ask that you would give us a curiosity to understand and experience other people in different ways. Lord, I pray for creativity. Speak to us. Give us creativity. Give us books to read. Give us people to encounter. Cause opportunities to fall on our lap in the coming days and weeks, I pray. And God, help us to have hospitality resist fear in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.
Thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for joining online. I'm so glad that you decided to join us. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next week.